Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to Ramacro. In this video, I'll be sharing my thoughts on the first part of the 2022 annual meeting of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. This is a big deal in the Jehovah's Witness calendar. Think of the annual meeting as sort of the annual Apple launch event at which the leadership, the governing body, give a series of talks which usually end up releasing some form of new light or announcing some new development, some new publication, something new to keep Jehovah's Witnesses believing that they are in an organization that is making waves and advancing in the global preaching work. So this is a series of talks in which there's always something to talk about. Governing body member David Splain is chairing this event, which took place on October 1st, 2022. He's going to use his opening remarks to unveil the latest Caleb and Sophia epic cartoon. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Now the program is going to feature a number of videos interspersed with uh, talks from various members of the governing body. I don't know what they're going to talk about, but they certainly have chosen some interesting themes. I'm going to be on the edge of my seat to see what they have to tell us. But first up is a video on one of our favorite subjects, Caleb and Sophia. Now, just so you know, Caleb is not a member of the governing body, but he's, he's going to be on the program anyway. Now, this is the longer version. They call it the epic version. It's part of the series uh, Become Jehovah's Friend. And the title is, Who Should Be My Friend? Let's watch. You got this one. Go, go, go. Yes. Bro, that was good. So we're only 50 seconds into the latest installment in the Caleb and Sophia saga, this being lesson 47, Who Should Be My Friend? 50 seconds in, and I'm already triggered as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, as someone who grew up in the Jehovah's Witness religion, I've repeatedly commented on the fact that when you're a Jehovah's Witness child, school somehow isn't just for learning. It's not just about going to school and receiving an education. You go to school at least partly with the objective of recruiting your classmates. We don't see that in the opening 50 seconds, but what we do see, maybe Tibor can overlay if he's feeling gracious, we do see Sophia in the playground reading a Jehovah's Witness publication while her friends around her are playing. So if you're watching this, as a Jehovah's Witness child, the message you're getting is, oh, I need to be reading Jehovah's Witness publications when I'm at school, when people around me are playing. I can't just enjoy myself with my school friends. I can't just use the break period to have a break from learning to just relax and unwind and laugh and play, I've got to somehow use this time to indoctrinate myself using 
Jehovah's Witness publications. That's the message you're getting as a child. That's the message parents are getting so that they'll be making sure children go to school with JW publications in their book bag to read during lunch break or whenever. I'm also curious as to this scene where Sophia is alone on the school bus and noticing her friends being picked up rather than being required to take the school bus. Maybe Tibor can again overlay. That's a bit of an odd scene. I don't quite understand what's being depicted here. Is this suggesting that if you're a good Jehovah's Witness, you'll take the school bus rather than be picked up. It's almost suggesting that it would be molly coddling or being overly indulgent of children if they were to be picked up by their parents. It's almost suggesting that children should be put to work, <laughs> which has been the message in the past. Thumbnail here to a talk by David Splain on the need for child labour. <laughs> the governing body just seems to think that children should be putting in a shift, whether it's participating in chores around the house, cleaning, whatever, or making sure that they are keeping on top of their studying and preparation for the meetings. I don't know, for me, in just the opening 50 seconds of this latest Caleb and Sophia cartoon, there's a distinct anti-children message that is harmonious with the overall tone of the governing body whenever they seem to talk about children especially the likes of Stephen Lett and David Splain, they seem to genuinely believe that most children have it too easy. And for me, that's what we're seeing depicted here. We see throughout the gospel accounts that those who chose to befriend Jesus gained the best friend possible. Hey there. Oh, you like to draw? I like your notes. Really cool. Mom taught me. Thanks for helping me remember. Me too. So, looks like we have a talk together. Yeah. I'll get in touch to practice soon. Lydia, we're leaving. Well, I gotta go. See you later, Sophia. Hey, bro. Hey, good to see you. I'm glad I was on your team. My favorite thing was the safari tree house. Yeah, it had all the cool jungle animals on the wall. Timmy, I didn't think your team was going to make it. I love my prize. You got a prize? We all did. <laughs> Okay, kids, settle down. Time to get started. We have a lot to talk about today. Before we begin, for those of you that participated in the science club this weekend, we will be having another camping trip. But only the ones with the highest score on the math project will be selected to go. More on that after class. Hey, now today Sophia, we, we need you in our club. You're good at science. We have another trip coming up. Hey, Sophia, come with us. So anyway, all the kids had badges and prizes and stuff. And it sounded like a lot of fun. And it seems like they really need my help. Mm. 
I see. Oh, you see what's wrong with the car? No, I wish. No, I see why you want to be in the club. You do? Of course. We all want to have friends and do fun things. Please, would you mind moving the light over here? Uh, right there. Thank you. I just wish I had some kid friends. Well, they really don't like kids doing science, do they? <laughs> this is the overwhelming message I'm picking up here. And they're doing it very subtly. They're not overtly suggesting that science is a bad thing. But the way the science club is being promoted in such a way that Sophia feels excluded the way there's this branding with the badge with the atom and toys being given out that Sophia can't have because she's not part of the club. For me, it's almost trying to paint science in a negative light so that young Jehovah's Witness children will view it as undesirable in some way or something that they either can't aspire to or shouldn't aspire to. But really, what is science? Science is what's given us the internet, JW Broadcasting, computers, JW Library, all of the benefits of modern technology and modern living derive from science. And yet for me, Young Jehovah's Witnesses here are being taught to think of science as something that is somehow beyond their reach or should be at least treated with a bit of caution. Then you have this scene where Sophia is confiding in her father when they're fixing the car. And ultimately the problem seems to be that Sophia doesn't have enough friends. Again, as someone raised in the Jehovah's Witness religion, this is entirely relatable. And it's not a good thing. It's not something that Jehovah's Witnesses should take pride in. The fact that their children are forced into a situation where they cannot cultivate friendships. Because if you think about it, they're going to school looking at all of their school friends, thinking if Armageddon were to come tomorrow, these would all die. So even if I were allowed to have them as friends, which I'm not, would I really want to get close to somebody who's going to die soon? That's the mentality you have as a young Jehovah's Witness or as the child of Jehovah's Witnesses and we can see the frustration being portrayed here in the form of Sophia. I just wish I had some kid friends. Mm. Jehovah wants you and me to have friends. But the question you need to ask yourself is, who should be my friend? Let's talk about it at our next family worship. How about you go do some research on Martha? And I will tell Caleb too. And then we can come back together and talk about it as a family. Sophia, are you ready? Yeah. Martha, a Jewess, the sister of Lazarus, and Mary. They lived in Bethany a village about two miles away from Jerusalem. Which was probably Jesus' home base when he came down from Galilee. Martha liked to cook. <laughs> yes, she did. And she would cook for Jesus and all his disciples when they would visit. Wow, that would have been a lot of food. Yes, and a lot of work. But if they worked together, they'd make it a success. However, some of their friends felt differently about Jesus.
Martha makes the best apricot cakes. It's just a fact. <laughs> You've always praised me too much, Talia. Well, if it gets me more apricot cakes, I will continue to praise you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Talia, did you hear? The teacher Jesus, he's coming back to visit. The man from Galilee? Are you, are you hosting him again? Yes, I am. Actually, it's tonight. I've heard a lot of talk. The Pharisees in Jerusalem, they don't approve of that man. I am not sure it's such a good idea for you to be known as his friend. Okay, well, I guess I better be getting home. See you two later. Martha, Jesus is here. Yay, cartoon Jesus is here. <laughs> Let's get the party started. This is just weird for me. I grew up in a religion where this sort of thing would have been considered deeply disrespectful. Whenever Jesus was depicted in the publications or the videos, they always tried to do it as respectfully as possible and in a way that dignified Jesus and made him look very i don't know they made him look like a perfect man which obviously jehovah's witnesses believe he was a perfect man and so to have him rendered in cartoon form with these odd kind of body dimensions and that kind of thing it's just it wouldn't have sat right with me when I was a believing Jehovah's Witness, and I'm sure many who are Jehovah's Witnesses now, especially those of my generation and older, will just have something niggling at the back of their head. Should we really be doing this? <laughs> I know it's not the first time they've done a cartoon Jesus, by the way. We have seen cartoon Jesus appear in previous installments of Caleb and Sophia but it doesn't sit right with me. It really doesn't. Even though I don't actually consider myself a Christian anymore, it, uh, it riles me, shall we say. What I do like, though, about this reimagining of the Mary and Martha story is this line. I've heard a lot of talk. The Pharisees in Jerusalem, they don't approve of that man. I am not sure it's such a good idea for you to be known as his friend. The Pharisees in Jerusalem don't approve of that man. I'm not sure it's such a good idea for you to be known as his friend. Isn't that the sort of language that Jehovah's Witnesses use when it comes to apostates? The governing body don't approve of such talk. I'm not sure it's such a good idea for you to hang around with someone who's murmuring against the organization. <laughs> Isn't that exactly the attitude that's encouraged inside Jehovah's Witnesses? There is no room, is there, for having or expressing an opinion that's different to those of the leaders. The Pharisees, if you think about it, the governing body. You could have Jesus walk into a kingdom hall and announce himself as Jesus and start teaching and sharing his ideas and he would probably get dragged out as an apostate. Let's be fair. That's the reality of the organization we have today. So I couldn't help but see more than a bit of irony in this particular scene. <laughs>
wait, 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 wait. Let me get this straight. He wanted you and Mary to sit and learn about God just like the men? The teacher instructing women, a woman's job is to provide food for her household. That's true. A good woman prepares herself for hard work. That's valuable. That's you, Martha. Don't let this Jesus ruin you with his ideas. sent word to Jesus. He will help my brother. You sent word to Jesus? Have you still not heard? He's angering people with his shocking speech. He's claiming to be God's son. He's crazy. He's he... loyal to Jehovah, and he is our friend. Sadly, Lazarus died. But do you remember what happened next? Jesus came back to Bethany and resurrected Lazarus. Jesus was a real friend. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And he showed them what kind of friend Jehovah can be to us. But that's not where the story ends. Do you know what some people did after that? Many of the Jews who saw what he did put faith in him. But some of them went off to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done? Why did they do that? Because not even seeing Jesus bring someone back to life was enough to convince them that he was the Christ. Okay, there are a couple of things I want to talk about here. The first being a scene which seems to portray Jesus as being progressive when it comes to the role of women in society. He wanted you and Mary to sit and learn about God just like the men. The teacher instructing women, a woman's job is to provide food for her household. That's true. A good woman prepares herself for hard work. What's happening here, I think, is actually quite subtle and clever. Ultimately, it amounts to managing expectations of women in the Jehovah's Witness organization. So imagine three levels. The top level being parity with men, where you get to teach. The middle level or second level being being able to be taught by men. And the bottom level or level one being you're just there to provide food if you're a woman. So imagine these three levels. And really all women should be on level three. There's no reason, is there, why women shouldn't be just as involved in teaching as men are. We should be seeing way more of women when it comes to all walks of life, including matters of belief and religion and that sort of thing. But Jehovah's Witnesses clearly don't believe that. They subscribe to the view of Paul, who said, let the women be silent in the congregation. And what they're doing here is they are trying to reframe the Mary and Martha story as told in Luke chapter 10 as being an example of Jesus being progressive and giving more empowerment to women. But what actually happened in the conversation that's just skimmed past, we don't even hear the words of Jesus, well, if Tibor is gracious, we can look up Luke chapter 10 and read verses 40 to 42. Martha, on the other hand, was distracted with attending to many duties, 
So she came to him and said, Lord, does it not matter to you that my sister has left me alone to attend to things? Tell her to come and help me. In answer, the Lord said to her, I'll help you what needs doing. <laughs> that would have been impressive. if he ha Imagine if he had said that. I would be thinking, okay, this is someone who understands that it's not the role of women to be handmaids, to be servants, to be essentially treated like cattle or robots in a household setting. Here's someone who's willing to muck in. Oh, but Lord, you have many wise things to tell us. And you need to be thinking about those important things rather than the mundane preparation of food and catering and that sort of thing. Oh, don't worry. As it happens, I am the world's greatest teacher. So I'm sure I can find a workaround. I'm sure I can either do a recap in the morning or give my talk in such a way that I can condense things and make things even more easily understood. I can do both. I can help you and I can be a teacher. <laughs> that conversation didn't happen. Instead, if we go back to the Bible, it says in verse 41, In answer the Lord said to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and disturbed about many things. A few things, though, are needed, or just one. For her part, Mary chose the good portion, and it will not be taken away from her. A few things are needed, and you're going to fulfill them because you're a woman. Is essentially what he's saying. And yet, in the Caleb and Sophia cartoon, they don't even show this conversation they just frame the whole episode as being, again, all about empowering women, as having the right to be taught. <laughs> Not being teachers, but simply having a right to be taught by men. Again, for me, this is managing the expectations of women. It's keeping them in their place and effectively saying you should be grateful just to be taught by men. At least we're not chaining you to the kitchen as used to be the case in the Jewish culture. So that got on my nerves. And then we have the whole crazy Lazarus coming back from the dead story. Jesus came back to Bethany and resurrected Lazarus. Jesus was a real friend. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He cared about Lazarus in particular, so that Lazarus got to cheat death. Why isn't he caring now about all of the millions who are dying? Nine million children dying every year before they can reach the age of five, people dying in all sorts of traumatic situations, people dying from war, people dying from pestilence. Why isn't Jesus caring about that? Why, why is he just caring about this dude called Lazarus? And regarding the Lazarus story, it's not really something I used to think about as a Jehovah's Witness or indeed as someone who considered himself a Christian. But it's worth noting that the whole Lazarus resurrection narrative only appears in the Gospel of John. So you have Matthew, no mention of Lazarus, being resurrected after four days. Mark, oh, I think we can skip that story. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. Luke, yeah, yeah, I, I gave that one a pass. Um, didn't really find that relevant. Only John, out of all of the gospel writers, thinks it's worthwhile to include a story where a man gets wrapped in cloth and put in a cave, having died 
and left there for four days in hot conditions and his body is reanimated. I, I'm sorry, if this really happened, what on earth were the writers of Matthew, Mark and Luke doing? Why did they omit this? This is a big deal. And why don't we hear more from Lazarus about his experience? Why isn't there a gospel of Lazarus? Why isn't there a letter of Lazarus? Sharing his experience as someone who was dead for four days but came back. I'm sorry, but this is just one of many examples of the gospel writers clearly just making things up. They seemed like Martha's friends, but they hated Jesus. How do you think Martha dealt with her unbelieving friends? Jesus is the Christ, the resurrection and the life. He is the Son of God, and he is my friend. Talia, you've been kind to me in the past, but you don't believe Jesus' teachings. We cannot be friends. Martha stuck with Jesus and his friends. They helped her become Jehovah's friend. So, Sophia, what do you think Jehovah is teaching you about friendship? That I have to choose my friends carefully. And how can you know if someone should be your friend? If they help me be Jehovah's friend, I am not going to join the club. That's my girl. We are so proud of you, Sophia. And Jehovah is proud of you, too. Now, how about you go finish up your homework? Mom tells me we have a guest coming over. Okay. Jehovah, please help me find a good friend. Someone who loves you. At least you are my friend. Lydia is here. Our talk. <laughs> you like turtles? I love turtles. Really? I've got something I want to show you. He is so cute. You know, Sophia, I think we're going to be friends. Yep, definitely friends. Admit it. You enjoy watching Caleb and Sophia just as much as the kids do. <laughs> and we know that because we get letters. Oh, I know you get letters, David. I also know that you're extremely selective in which letters you take seriously. We might mention that we've had just a few parents write in expressing concern that some of our videos depict scenes that could have an effect on children who've been protected from anything even hinting at an act of violence. We very much appreciate the concern. However, when portraying a Bible account, we cannot ignore the message Jehovah saw fit to preserve in His Word. We don't feel comfortable watering down the inspired insight that Jehovah has preserved for the benefit 
of true worshippers. So when it's a letter praising the governing body for their Caleb and Sophia videos, when it's a letter telling the governing body that they've done a splendid job and that the Caleb and Sophia videos are enjoyed even by adults, those are letters that they can take seriously. Those are letters that give them knowledge about their audience. But if it's a letter from a parent complaining about violence and gore in convention dramatizations, then, well, we think we know better, actually, than the parents. That's the message I'm getting. And no, I'm sorry, David Splain, I do not enjoy the Caleb and Sophia cartoons. This one is a perfect example of the manipulation. I mean, just think about it. It's one thing to manipulate adults, as we see in, for example, the Jade and Nita dramatizations. You know, using all the tools that cults commonly use to control people's thinking and behavior and emotions, wielding those dark arts on adults is one thing. But when you start manipulating kids, doesn't that say something about how low you're willing to sink? If it's for the furtherance of your organization and your power, you're willing to do that. I think that's another level of evil. And for me, what we saw in the concluding few minutes of the Caleb and Sophia cartoon was just a blatant call to shun those who don't support the Jehovah's Witness belief system. Talia, you've been kind to me in the past, but you don't believe Jesus' teachings. We cannot be friends. If you don't believe Jesus' teachings, as interpreted for you by the governing body, then I'm sorry, you're not friend material. And what's interesting is, this is an entirely made-up conversation. This conversation never took place. This Talia is an invented character. If you actually go to the account of Lazarus in John chapter 11, well, I actually won't read it because, you know, I don't, I don't need to read it to make the point that this isn't in there. But if you want to check, it's John chapter 11, verses 43 through 47, where it describes Lazarus rising from the dead after four days. And then it describes some having faith in Jesus due to witnessing the resurrection, but some going off to the Pharisees to tell them about what Jesus had done. That's the story. And from that simple passage in John chapter 11, they've spun it out to include this character called Talia, who was complaining about Jesus, or essentially bitching about Jesus, and who therefore was unworthy of being a friend. If the Bible is truly the word of God, why can't they just use the Bible? Why do they have to make up characters and make up conversations and add them to the Bible? Why is that necessary? What you're effectively saying is the Bible's not enough. We could do with a few more stories that aren't in the Bible. So on the subject of shunning and how important it is to shun, we're going to make up a story that's a spin-off from the Lazarus Mary Martha story. That's what they've said here. And it's similar to the whole thing with doctored verses in the New World Translation. Thumbnail here to the first part 
of that series or the series in which I cover these verses if Tibor is gracious? What does it say about your underlying respect for the Bible as God's word if you treat it with such disdain as to not only change the Bible to suit your ideas or in places where the Bible says something awkward, but you also add to the Bible stories or conversations that never happened. For me, there's an underlying problem with an organization claiming to be all about the Bible, but treating it so casually as something that can just be changed as they see fit. And then you have Sophia giving the application of this made-up Talia story. So, Sophia, what do you think Jehovah is teaching you about friendship? That I have to choose my friends carefully. And how can you know if someone should be your friend? If they help me be Jehovah's friend, I am not going to join the club. That's my girl. We are so proud of you, Sophia. Wow. How repulsive. Not only is Sophia learning from a made-up story that isn't even in the Bible, that she can only be friends with people who help her be friends with Jehovah, in other words, other Jehovah's Witnesses, not only is she learning that her opportunities to have any kind of social network are limited strictly to members of a certain religious movement, but she's also learning that it would be bad or wrong for her to join a science club. Which, I mean, you can be part of a science club without it being a mandatory requirement for you to be friends with everyone within that club. What, honestly, does the, the science club have to do with this whole idea of friendship and who should or shouldn't be your friend? It's profoundly dark and coercive, isn't it? It's not just about the shunning. It's not just about guilting Jehovah's Witness children who happen to have friends who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. There's also a subplot of anti-science because it has to be a science club that's involved here, doesn't it? Science is the issue. They don't want, it seems, Jehovah's Witness children either having friends who aren't other Jehovah's Witnesses or being enthusiastic students of science. We are living in the last of the last days. That means soon we are going to face events that will test our integrity as never before. Yes, now is the time that we need to be alert and decisive. As we face the Great Tribulation, brothers and sisters, we don't know exactly all the details of what will happen, but we do know that Jesus did not mean that we would have to flee one literal city or go to a certain mountain range. How could we? We're scattered over the whole face of the earth. But we do need to remember the same things that the first century Christians needed to remember. Don't put our trust in the religious and political systems of Satan's world. Why is this so vital? Just as in 66 CE, today we see one event after another leading up to the final day. Everywhere. There is evidence of political instability and infighting, not only among nations, but also within nations. Religious, political, and social issues, including abortion and homosexuality, have become divisive topics. Scientific issues, such as global warming, 
have also become political issues. Just as in the first century, we must take to heart Jesus' warning. Don't take sides in the chaos that's happening all around us. Yes, keep your focus on the kingdom hope. We've been watching governing body member Jeffrey Jackson taking us through the talk, Be Alert, Be Decisive. This is the first talk on the program for the 2022 annual meeting. I've managed to whittle the talk down to just three parts of interest. Quite frankly, this was a dull talk. Jeffrey Jackson essentially gives a history lesson to his audience, in which he seems to be basing much of his material on the writings of Josephus. He takes his audience through the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In particular, he focuses on 66 AD, when Roman armies began a siege of Jerusalem and then mysteriously withdrew. At one point, he even quotes verbatim from Josephus, almost as though Josephus is scripture, <laughs> can be considered on a level pegging with the Bible in terms of how reliable it is as a historical source. I'm not sure it's wise to do that with Josephus, or indeed consistent with the organization's position in the past. Josephus is a very useful resource, don't get me wrong, but it's also a little bit strange. For example, Josephus claimed that the remains of Noah's Ark were still in existence in his day and were something of a tourist attraction. <laughs> So, and that's just one example of a number of very interesting claims, shall we say, that Josephus makes. So, for Jeffrey Jackson to essentially cherry-pick Josephus as a secular history source that we can trust, while simultaneously dismissing other sources or other historical writers, I find to be quite disingenuous. Anyway, you'll have noticed, I'm sure, Jeffrey Jackson beginning his talk with this slogan about the last of the last days. We are living in the last of the last days. Yes, the last of the last days, as was made clear to us, of course, by Stephen Lett when he gave Governing Body Update number one of 2020, Stephen Lett. I'm not going to play you the clip because I've played it many times on this channel. You're all familiar with it, hopefully. But Stephen Lett in said clip told us in March of 2020 that we were in the last of the last days shortly before the last day of the last days. So since March of 2020, it's been the last of the last days. I actually went on Watchtower Online Library. I was curious to see whether this phrase came up. And indeed, the earliest it comes up on Watchtower Online Library, bearing in mind you can only go so far back. You can't, for example, go back to the writings of Rutherford or Charles Taze Russell, even though the organization could, if it wanted to, allow you to read those materials and indeed search them. But if you type in, in brackets, last of the last days on Watchtower Online Library, you will find this quote from the 2019 October Watchtower, pages eight and nine, because so much time has passed since 1914, we must now be living in the last of the last days. So Stephen Lett wasn't the first to coin this phrase. It dates at least to October 2019, which if you think about it, is over three years of it being the last of the last days. 
surely those words just lose all meaning, don't they? The more time passes after you utter them. If Armageddon had come in 2020 or in 2021, then yes, they would have been the last of the last days. But, you know, when three years and counting have passed, surely we can categorically say that this is just plain fear-mongering. This is just plain doomsday twaddle of the sort that we've heard throughout the organization's history. Jeffrey Jackson has a few things to say about Armageddon and the Great Tribulation and the extent to which Jehovah's Witnesses should be prepared. In fact, I found this particular comment interesting. But we do know that Jesus did not mean that we would have to flee one literal city or go to a certain mountain range. How could we? We're scattered over the whole face of the earth. That's quite an interesting point, Jeffrey. In fact, that's the same point I made in response to the concluding music video of the 2022 convention. To the ends of the earth, there'll be peace at last for all eternity. So in the same year, you have a convention video showing Jehovah's Witnesses fleeing a physical location, going up into the hills or mountains, and <laughs> the same year as they reveal this video at their convention, they hold an annual meeting in which a governing body member says, of course... We won't be required to flee to a mountain range or from one physical location to another physical location because Jehovah's Witnesses are all over the planet. Which is it? <laughs> if that's really the case, what Jeffrey Jackson has just said, then how do we interpret what they showed us at the beginning of the music video, Peace at Last? Why did they go to the trouble of depicting Jehovah's Witnesses fleeing from the destruction at Armageddon? Then you have Jeffrey Jackson walking us through the same old talking points when it comes to proofs that we're in the last days. Everywhere there is evidence of political instability and infighting, not only among nations, but also within nations. Everywhere there is evidence of political instability and infighting, as opposed to that time in human history when there was no political instability, no bickering, no arguing. Everyone just agreed with each other. Do you remember that time in our history lessons when everyone was just totally on the same page? And everyone just let everyone else get on with whatever they wanted to do. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeffrey, you'll have to try harder than that. And the same can be said of these comments. Religious, political and social issues, including abortion and homosexuality, have become divisive topics. Apparently, Jeffrey just has a problem with issues being issues. <laughs> it's evidence that we're in the last days if people care about stuff and if people want to solve problems what more evidence do you need people care about the fact that our earth is heating up that our ocean levels are rising that there is too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we are too over-reliant on fossil fuels how dare they you know what a shocking development this sort of thing could only be happening if we're on the brink of the earth being ruled over by Jeffrey Jackson and his friends. What more proof do you need? That's the logic we're being given here. And he says, quote, religious, political and social issues, including abortion and homosexuality, have become divisive 
topics. I think what you mean is those were always divisive topics because there have always been people who are against the freedom of women to decide for themselves what they do with their bodies and people who are against the idea of people being free to love whoever they want to love. There have always been those people. It's just that in the past, they were in charge. They got to dictate how life should be for everybody else. And now, because of societal progress, the voices who say, that's not on, people should be free to love who they want to love, and women should be free to have a say in what happens with their bodies. Those voices are being amplified, and developments such as the reversal of Roe versus Wade in the Supreme Court is being met with justifiable outrage. That's not evidence of society moving backwards. That's evidence of society moving forwards. Imagine if Jeffrey Jackson or a person like Jeffrey Jackson had been commenting in the 1950s. He could have said, religious, political and social issues, including racism and racial equality have become divisive topics. He could have just as easily said that, couldn't he, during the civil rights movement. We needed the civil rights movement so that we could begin to tackle racial equality. And racial equality continues to be a problem deep into the 21st century. But the very fact that there is division doesn't mean that the world is getting worse or that things are degenerating. It means that there is healthy debate. It means that the winds of change are blowing and there is hope that things will get better. Whereas in the past, things were only bad. There was only bigotry. There was only racism. There was only slavery. There was only women having to go to backstreet clinics and risk their lives because abortion was against the law. And there was only a world in which people like Alan Turing had to get chemically castrated for the crime of being gay. Let's turn to the record in Luke chapter 19. Luke 19 and verses 41 through 44. And here the inspired account tells us that when Jesus got nearby, he viewed the city and wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had discerned on this day the things having to do with peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, because the days will come upon you when your enemies will build around you a fortification of pointed stakes and will encircle you and besiege you from every side. They will dash you and your children with, uh, with, within you to the ground. And they will not leave a stone upon a stone in you because you did not discern the time of your being inspected. What do we see from these verses? Do we see the compassion Jesus had for those who would be killed when Jerusalem was to be destroyed? Yes, he was envisioning the destruction that would occur in the year 70 CE. He was moved by the emotions of that, so much so that he cried loudly, not silently like he did when he was about to resurrect Lazarus, but audibly, loudly. Now, what do we learn from this? Well, for a start, we can see Jehovah's love for people as reflected in Jesus. Jesus was very distraught, thinking about what would happen to that city and its inhabitants. And then in verse 44, 
What was the other thing that Jesus was distressed about? That that was a time of judgment, we might say, or inspection. Yes, even though Jesus was thinking ahead to the future events, he realized that they were missing the opportunity at that time to do something, things that they needed to do to prepare for the future. There's something else that we learn too. Not only do we learn from the compassion that Jesus displayed, which we should likewise display when we think about what's going to happen to this wicked world. Whoa, hold on there, Jeffrey Jackson. We need to show compassion to people in this wicked world who are about to be destroyed? Did Tony Morris not get that memo? Since they're Jehovah's enemies and Jehovah's our best friend, that means they're our enemies. How we look forward to these enemies of Jehovah, our enemies, vanishing like smoke. The apostates and the enemies of Jehovah would say, well, that's gruesome, that's despicable. You teach your people these things? No, God teaches his people these things. This is what he's foretelling. And frankly, for friends of Jehovah God, how reassuring that they're finally going to be gone. All these despicable enemies that have uh, just reproached Jehovah's name, destroyed, never, ever to live again. Now, it's not that we rejoice in someone's death, but when it comes to God's enemies, finally, they're out of the way, especially these despicable apostates who at one point had dedicated their life to God, and then they joined forces with Satan, the devil, the chief apostate of, of all time. So while we eagerly await Jehovah's bringing his enemies to the end, just to emphasize this, but the wicked will perish, the enemies of Jehovah will vanish like glorious pastures, particularly they will vanish like smoke. So this, I thought this would be a nice memory aid, to this verse stay in the mind. Here's what Jehovah's promising. Okay. as Jehovah's enemies. They're gonna vanish like smoke. Tony Morris there, showing us what compassion looks like. I mean, <laughs> who do we listen to? Do we listen to Jeffrey Jackson, who's gone on this long lecture about the events of 66 and 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem, the besieging of Jerusalem in 66 AD, and the destruction by the Romans in 70 AD or CE. <laughs> and he's reading the verse there from Luke 19, verses 41 to 44, and making a point of the tears of Christ, the fact that Jesus gave way to sobbing at the thought of all of the death that was about to happen. And Jeffrey Jackson is specifically telling his audience that they need to have similar compassion regarding those who will be slaughtered at Armageddon. But what did we just see in that infamous clip of Tony Morris with his match, his, his lit match that he's blowing out gleefully? Where's the compassion there? This is an organization that speaks out of both sides of its mouth. And isn't this exactly the sort of thing you can expect from a human man-made religion that's just making things up as they go along. They are bound to contradict themselves. Many of us have had to face the issue with regard to blood transfusions. When do you need to make your decision with regard to that? Is it when you're in the ambulance, semi-conscious, in pain? Is it like, oh, hand me the DPA? 
can you read the fine print? <laughs> or is it when you get into the emergency operating room and you start arguing with people and asking questions? No. We realize that now is the time that we need to make our decisions. Then we need to live by those decisions. And then if an emergency should occur, we'll be ready for that situation. That was the lesson Jesus was teaching them. Yes, the Christians back in the first century had to rid themselves of any feelings of nationalistic pride, any feelings that Jerusalem was the city. Otherwise, they would make the wrong decision. Well, who knew Jesus was teaching people to refuse blood transfusions? <laughs> it, it just goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. In the 2022 annual meeting, first talk here being given by Jeffrey Jackson, his theme, Be Alert, Be Decisive. As you've just seen, he needed to talk there about blood transfusions. He just needed to say something about the need for Jehovah's Witnesses to make their decision regarding blood. And apparently even Jesus had something to say on this. That's what he's inferring towards the end there. Just one small problem. How could Jesus have known anything about blood transfusions? But anyway, how... My question would be, how can we really call this a decision? Now is the time that we need to make our decisions. Then we need to live by those decisions. Or, as is often the case, die by those decisions. That's what this is. This is a life or death decision. Only it isn't really a decision because it's a command. It's called the blood command, the blood teaching. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, although they try to make it sound like it's about personal choice, when they're slithering their way into meetings with healthcare professionals, oh, this we're just here to help Jehovah's Witness patients exercise their personal choice, their personal freedoms when it comes to healthcare, nonsense. It literally says in the Shepherd, the Flock of God book that the elder has in his briefcase when he's stood in front of those doctors in that boardroom or wherever. It literally says that any Jehovah's Witness who willfully and unrepentantly accepts a blood transfusion will be disassociated meaning that they will be separated from their loved ones who are Jehovah's Witnesses. They will be shunned. So they will be penalized for making the wrong decision. So I have to ask any Jehovah's Witnesses watching, how honest do you think Jeffrey Jackson is being here? I would argue he is utterly misrepresenting the blood teaching, the blood issue, call it what you will. The simple truth is, when it comes to the refusal of blood transfusions and Jehovah's Witnesses, it's certainly messed up and immoral and barbaric. But a genuine choice, it definitely is not. The brothers of the Coordinators Committee of the Governing Body we're analyzing with us about how to help and what we could do. Immediately, the first disaster relief committee was set up. And when we realized that there was already a need in the whole of Poland, 16 committees started their work. The number of DC-50 applications of those who wanted to volunteer increased every week by thousands indicating that the willingness and readiness to help was huge. We prepared everything in order to be able to welcome the refugees at the border crossings, at the reception point set up by the authorities on the Ukrainian border, and at other locations where the trains from Ukraine were arriving. 
we knew we would have to ask the congregations for accommodations. At the beginning, we prepared a survey that helped us to organize everything. We know that it's thanks to Jehovah's backing because in just a few days, we received more than 7,500 replies. Four assembly halls and 22 kingdom halls were temporarily converted to refugee relief centers. Having this opportunity to help the brothers, we saw an expression of Jehovah's love and might in all these efforts. Only Jehovah could prepare his people for such a well-organized and effective activity. Many of the brothers have commented that the fact that they see so much being done to help the brothers in Ukraine right now uh, convinces them that if they're in that situation in the future, if there's some time when they need that love or they need that help, well, Jehovah's organization is going to be there to help them as well. Belonging to Jehovah's household, being part of a worldwide family is priceless. The hatred in the world continues to grow constantly and there's just more conflict and, and disunity. Uh, at the same time, the unity and the love of Jehovah's people just keeps on increasing and it just becomes more and more powerful. If you say so, Mark Sanderson. So we've been watching part of the 2022 annual meeting. There's quite a lot of material in this year's annual meeting devoted to what is essentially an exercise in the organization patting itself on the back regarding the war in Ukraine, which has taken countless lives. It's yet another example, unfortunately, of this organization leaping on any catastrophe as an opportunity to brag about how brilliant it is. I'm sorry, that's just the way they do things. This is the way this organization operates. Any development, good or bad, when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses and their response as an organization is brandished as evidence that only with Jehovah's help could this happen. I obviously made a video, or I've made a few videos now about the Ukraine war as it pertains to Jehovah's Witnesses. If Tibor is gracious, here is a thumbnail of a JW Watch episode where I summarized the organization's response. And here is another thumbnail of a video that we made. This was actually a video where myself and the rest of my team went to the Hungary-Ukraine border with two vans to try to retrieve as many refugees as we could. And in the end, we managed to move 11 refugees. We didn't go to the border thinking, we only want to retrieve atheist refugees. We only want to retrieve Catholic refugees. We only want to find Jehovah's Witness refugees. We were just looking for refugees. We just wanted to help anyone. And ours was just a drop in the ocean. If you think about it, when it comes to the amount of humanitarian energy and effort and compassion that was flung at Ukraine and continues to be because the war is still raging there and there's still a need to help those people and people are being helped by organized efforts regardless of their religious persuasions. None of that can be said regarding anything that we've just seen here. As I've repeatedly argued, the Jehovah's Witness organization looks out for itself and they can pat themselves on the back about having that attitude if they want. I just don't see anything impressive about it. It certainly is an evidence of divine intervention, which is how this is being framed. 
thanks to Jehovah's backing, this humanitarian work was done. Only Jehovah could prepare his people for such a well-organized and effective activity. Those are the words that have just been spoken. When we set out with our two vans, we didn't do it just by ourselves. It wasn't just a case of let's jump in two vans and let's drive to the border. It was a coordinated effort. There was a Facebook group that we were in contact with and they were guiding us regarding what location to go to and which people at that location most needed help. So there were total strangers, people that we didn't know on this Facebook group who were working around the clock to make sure that total strangers who were in need of help from Ukraine could receive help. That is impressive. That impresses me because there's no strings attached. There's no, oh, well, as long as they're of a certain belief system, as long as they share my ideas and my values, there was none of that. It was just, these people need help. We need vans. We need drivers. Who do we have? And at that particular time, my team and I were in a position to do something. So we did something. We're not going to jump up and down about it. Yes, we made a video, but it's not like we're going to claim that we were being directed by God or that our efforts were evidence of any kind of divine intervention, which is the claim that's being made here. And unfortunately, as the annual meeting progresses, you're going to see more such material where the organization applauds itself for doing the mundane and helping its members when they needed to flee a war zone. We thought it might be a truck driving by. When it happened again, we got up and started reading the news on the internet. And we found out that there were explosions happening in all the cities. My mom awoke from her sleep to sirens sounding all over the city. Of course, we were very anxious and turned on the TV immediately. But we didn't even have to look for information because all the channels were already talking about the fact that war had started. Every day, it became more difficult. It became more difficult to deliver food, and the food became more expensive. People started to panic, which led to panic buying of medicines and basic staple products. Yes, before that, during the pandemic, for two years now, Brothers had been constantly reminding us of the necessity of go bags. And then, closer to the war, reminders also began to come from brothers about not only stocking up on such backpacks, but also about checking what condition they were in. And it was also recommended to stock up on food for two months in advance. Here again, unfortunately, we have more of the Jehovah's Witness organization praising itself over the Ukraine war. And in this particular case, the preparedness of Jehovah's Witnesses in Ukraine when war struck. I certainly don't see it as a bad thing that Jehovah's Witnesses in Ukraine and elsewhere are encouraged to have go bags. I suppose it's common sense, isn't it? Given the way things are, the way things always have been, with political, civil unrest, natural disasters, which are increasing due to climate change, it makes sense to have plans in place, to have equipment and essentials ready. I just don't see it as being anything unique or anything to brag about. 
And in fact, what this smacks of, again, is exploiting a war that is killing countless people, exploiting misery and carnage to promote an organization, to make an organization look as though it's the answer. Only if you're a Jehovah's Witness would you be able to deal with this situation. What an insult that is to the millions of Ukrainians that are dealing with this disaster, are dealing with this atrocity by Putin's Russia without being in a cult or without being in the Jehovah's Witness cult in particular. What an insult it is to them to suggest that the only way you can really get through all of this is if you have a belief that eight dudes in New York, USA, are a channel between the Almighty and mankind. Nonsense. And by the way, go-bags are by no means unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. There's such a thing as prepping... <laughs> Many of you in America will know all about prepping, particularly, I guess, in the Bible Belt. It's a big thing, isn't it, in America? Lots of people, for whatever reason, believe in the necessity of keeping supplies ready. In fact, some go as far as to build bunkers or rent bunkers that have been pre-built for like a nuclear emergency. You know, this sort of thinking isn't unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. Lots of people subscribe to that sort of thinking, including to extremes of that sort of thinking. It doesn't make any of these people closer to God. It doesn't make them the channel with the Almighty. It just means they're concerned about world events and want to be ready. But if you're a Jehovah's Witness, everything's different. No, no. Our organization is prepared for Armageddon. And isn't it interesting that just a short while before the war broke out in Ukraine, we were getting reminders about our go-bags and making sure our go-bags were in good condition. Come on. Is this what we're stooping to now when it comes to pointing at evidence? For God's backing. Isn't this precisely what you would expect of any doomsday group, any fear-mongering group that points frantically at signs that these are the last days? Wouldn't you expect such a group to encourage, for better or worse, disaster preparedness? Only, unfortunately, this isn't just a case of disaster preparedness, is it? It's not just a case of encouraging people to be ready for any situation. This is a case of an organization exploiting and pouncing upon misery and death as an opportunity to promote itself. There were no lights. We drove large sections of the road in one go, constantly praying that we wouldn't get a flat tire, that the car wouldn't break down, and that we wouldn't get stuck in a field. I don't think we ever prayed as much as we did during those hours on the road. My husband tried to stay as calm as possible and reassure me so that I wouldn't worry. A sister found out that there would be an evacuation train and we kind of wanted to get on it, but we were not sure that we would. But this time, with prayers, she managed to organize the transportation, and both our families went. It was amazing that this train had a special carriage for people with disabilities. And we were taken to this carriage, and the train was even delayed until we sat down. They were waiting for us. Before we left, we informed the elders that we had made up our minds and we were going. The brothers sent us a certain amount of money. They said, this is to help you. And when we boarded the train, we found out that we had to pay for the train. 
Although before that all evacuation trains were free, they told us the amount for the tickets and it was exactly the same as what the brothers had given us. We've just been listening to evidence of divine intervention in the Ukraine war in the 2022 annual meeting of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, apparently. So this, again, unfortunately, is a brazen attempt at exploiting the war in Ukraine that has caused untold bloodshed, misery, suffering. If you're a group like Jehovah's Witnesses, unfortunately, the ends justify the means. There's no boundaries. You get to just use that suffering as leverage to show how brilliant your organization is. That's unfortunately what we're seeing here. And we're being asked to believe that Jehovah arranged for this couple, one of whom is disabled, to be given some money that would pay for the train ticket. My question would be, why just the train ticket? <laughs> what about when you get off the train? What about your needs for accommodation when you arrive at your destination? What about your need for food? What are you supposed to not eat on the train or when you get off the train? This is the sort of flimsy snake oil salesman-like reasoning that Jehovah's Witnesses are being spoon-fed now. Let's say, for argument's sake, that the train ticket was $40. It's not unimaginable that refugees, Jehovah's Witness refugees fleeing the country, might be handed by their fellow believers $40. <laughs> That's not... I mean, I'm laughing, it's a serious situation, but my laughter is at the absurdity of the claim. I'm sorry, that is not a convincing or persuasive claim whatsoever. If it gives this dear sweet lady comfort to think that, then fine, I suppose. Although I would ask her to consider what it says about people who didn't make it out of Ukraine in one piece, or those who stayed behind and have suffered as a result, some even dying as a result, either who were Jehovah's Witnesses or not Jehovah's Witnesses, what makes her special would be my question. Why does she get to get that money and get that passage out? Whereas other people in Ukraine need to suffer, including her own fellow believers. This is the arrogance, as I've said before, of, I guess you could say, Christian belief. I really do recoil whenever I hear people say, oh, well, I prayed for this and this is what the Lord gave me. And I'm stood there thinking, well, why are you so special? Why did you get this blessing, whether it's a cure for your ulcer or whether it's a cure for your swollen ankle or a job offer or some kind of financial kickback? Why do you get that sort of benefit while children are dying? and people are suffering. What makes you special? This is the arrogance, not just of Jehovah's Witness belief, but Christian belief. I really do struggle with it. And what especially grates me is the way this organization puts these people on camera who've been through this terrible ordeal, using them for its propaganda, and making them recount stories essentially of kindness and goodness that's been extended to them by Satan's wicked system. It was amazing that this train had a special carriage for people with disabilities. 
and we were taken to this carriage, and the train was even delayed until we sat down. They were waiting for us. The train had a special carriage for people with disabilities, and they delayed the train's departure until this lady was seated comfortably and ready for the journey to begin. That's Satan's wicked system. And if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you have to believe that the organizers of this train and the people on board the train that made sure she was comfortable and made sure the train didn't depart until she was comfortable deserve to die at an impending Armageddon. We drove for 16 hours and we arrived very late. In Lviv, a group of police approached and took me to the security service of Ukraine. Since I have a Russian passport, I am essentially like an enemy to them. I knew that Jehovah was with Dad, that he would protect him, and that most likely he would not be dragged there to prison or something like that. But I was worried that they might simply not let us go further and we would stay in Ukraine. I sat and waited. I prayed to Jehovah. And this helped me not to focus on my negative thoughts, but to trust Jehovah completely. They begin to incite me to say such slogans as Glory to Ukraine. I answered, I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and we take a neutral position in this war. We do not support the Russian side, but I also cannot glorify some other country. And then he told me to curse Putin. I said, well, since I am a believer, I cannot speak swear words. So I cannot say this either. And the policeman said, yes, I know your people. They don't want to defend their homeland. I replied, well, if I were a conscript, I would fight against Ukraine now, since I am Russian. He said, well, then save your family. Go with God, Alexei. He gave me back my documents and wished me a good journey. This apparently is also evidence of divine intervention in favor of Jehovah's Witnesses during the Ukraine war. And don't get me wrong, I really do sympathize with this dear sweet looking family. It must have been a tense situation for them. It is certainly awkward that Alexei was fleeing Ukraine with his family as someone with a Russian passport trying to get out of Ukraine. And I think we can all remember, especially in those early days of the war, there was an issue with Russians who were driving around in cars without wearing uniforms, setting out to destroy Ukrainian infrastructure and generally frustrate Ukraine. And how were the people, how were the forces in Lviv supposed to know whether this guy, Alexei, was a threat or not? It seems they were asking fairly common sense questions of him. If you think about it from their perspective, he may say, they began to incite me. That's very interesting language. We're talking about an exchange with the authorities. So it's not a case of the authorities asking him questions and asking him to say certain things that would reassure them that he's not a Russian saboteur or someone acting on behalf of the Russian forces. It has to be something more devious. It has to be something more manipulative. Kind of hypocritical, isn't it, when we're talking about manipulation for the Ukrainian authorities to be accused of this effectively 
when this is an organization that has perfected the art of manipulation, asking Alexei to say glory to Ukraine or to swear against Putin, I think that's quite a reasonable requirement. And it seems that when he was unable to do that, and he explained why he was unable to do that, it's not like he just said, no, I'm not going to do that. Leaving them with no choice but to put him in a cell, he was able to explain why it was that he couldn't say glory to Ukraine or why he couldn't swear against Putin. And the authorities were satisfied with his explanation and let him go on his way. There's absolutely nothing unique about that story. It, if anything, it shows how reasonable the authorities can be. Let's remember, this is an organization that wants us to believe that the authorities are out to persecute Jehovah's Witnesses at any opportunity. This is Satan's system of things. And Satan is bent on making life as terrible as possible for Jehovah's people. And yet here we have an example of the authorities being reasonable and allowing a Russian Jehovah's Witness with his family to flee Ukraine after he'd explained their predicament. So which is it? It's like the point I try to make in my song, Good Things, Bad Things, thumbnail here if T-Boy is gracious. Unfortunately, just about any outcome will be claimed by Jehovah's Witnesses as evidence that they are the one true religion. Different brothers and sisters began to visit us straight away and each time there was someone new and they always brought some bags or boxes. And for the non-witnesses, it was like a miracle. And they kept asking, do you know them? Are these your relatives? No, we have never seen them before. Why are they helping you? Oh, it was such a good witness. Feeling forced to move to another country is very difficult. But thanks to Jehovah, I have become convinced that his organization really functions as one body. And I'm very happy to be part of it. The Brotherhood. These are the people waiting for you with open arms. We felt that it was Jehovah who personally helped us. It is really evident that a lot of refugees from Ukraine who come here are alone with their problems. And it is very difficult for them. How much easier it is for us because we have a friendly brotherhood with us. And although we're in a foreign country, we feel at home. All thanks go to Jehovah. It's a friendly brotherhood, all right, but it's a friendly brotherhood whose love is entirely conditional on you believing as they believe. I've said it many, many times, but what does it say of an organization that will only look out for its own? That's what I saw firsthand when I visited the Ukraine-Hungary border with the rest of my team, with the two vans to pick up Ukrainian refugees. We saw the Jehovah's Witnesses there, stood next to their sign. And we asked them, would you take Catholics? Would you help Catholics to get a bed for the night, to be moved away from this war zone so that they can be somewhere safe and somewhere warm and somewhere where they're protected? And instead of answering us straight and saying, no, we wouldn't, they lied to us. They couldn't tell the truth. Look, I think it's great that Jehovah's Witnesses look out for at least their own. It would be terrible if they did nothing. It would be terrible if the organization, when something like the Ukraine war happens, just folded its arms 
and left Jehovah's Witnesses in Ukraine to their own devices, that would be appalling. So I think at least some praise is deserved that they can look out for their own, that they can make sure that their own believers are taken care of. I would frankly rather have seen Jehovah's Witnesses on the border ready to receive other Jehovah's Witnesses than no one, than no one there waiting for Jehovah's Witnesses to arrive. I just don't see how it's anything extraordinary. I just don't see any conspicuous evidence of divine love, of divine compassion, of genuine care and concern for human life if it's all about what belief system you're part of and whether you share the same beliefs as the person extending the help. That's nothing to be proud of, but predictably, Jehovah's Witnesses are proud of having that approach, are proud of looking out for their own and not helping everyone, to the point where they've devoted a sizable chunk of their annual meeting program in 2022 to patting themselves on the back over their handling of the Ukraine war. So now we're going to give attention to Brother Tony Morris. Hi, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Brother Morris is going to uh, talk to us on the theme, They Will Be Sensational. Now to our theme, They Will Be Sensational. What is they, they are family reunions in the new world. Mm -hmm. The things that are coming, oh, go ahead and use your imagination. Jehovah won't fault you for that. They're going to be sensational. They really are. Now, another word for sensational is astonishing. Another one is astounding. And what's nice, this is not a fantasy. This is what's going to happen. It's a reality. So the reunion with your loved ones is a certainty. You will be enjoying your family reunions soon. Keep your anchor in good shape till the sea of wicked mankind is no more. And we entreat you, focus on the coming sensational Family Reunions. Sorry, I couldn't resist having a little bit of fun there with Tony Morris exiting the stage. That's not the whole talk, obviously. Just that for whatever reason, it takes Tony a while to explain what his theme actually means. As you heard there, David Splain announced Tony Morris as giving the theme, They Will Be Sensational. And it's only some way into the talk that we find out that this theme is purely about the resurrection and specifically families of Jehovah's Witnesses, including Bible characters who were faithful, having sensational family reunions. That's it. <laughs> And thank you, Tony, for giving us some synonyms for sensational. Another word for sensational is astonishing. Another one is astounding. Wow, who knew? <laughs> so, a bit of an English lesson here. Um, <laughs> thrown in as a freebie by Tony Morris. Seriously, though, I have to ask. I asked this loads, I know, and I'm repeating myself. But if you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, look me in the eye and tell me that this man is wise and knowledgeable 
and someone who we really ought to be listening to. All I can see is a babbling, incoherent, likely inebriated man who is trying desperately to sell a fantasy. He says it's not a fantasy, but it very much is. Only it's more than a fantasy. It's the use and exploitation of grief and bereavement as a carrot on a stick. This is one of the most sinister aspects, in my opinion, of the Jehovah's Witness religion, the way it holds people captive through their grief, the way it says, you know what, if you want a spectacular reunion with your father, with your mother, with your spouse, with your child, you need to follow us. You need to obey eight guys in New York and then maybe maybe you'll have a spectacular reunion in paradise with your loved one. How shady. This, again, is snake oil salesman rhetoric. The very need to come up with words like spectacular should tell you everything. Roll up, roll up for the spectacular resurrection reunion. Come on. We're grown-ups now. We're not stupid. We can see straight through this sleazy, shady, manipulative rhetoric. And I, for one, will not have the memory of my loved ones who died as believing Jehovah's Witnesses used to make me bend my knee to charlatans like Toni Morris. In verse 1 of Revelation 21... And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away. Now notice, and the sea is no more. Well, the sea is no more. What are we talking about here? Well, that uh, means that after Armageddon, there's no more sea. Well, obviously, that's not literal with the oceans or the seas there. That's the demon-agitated sea of wicked mankind. Gone. But it's not gone yet. See? And just like in literal wars, submarines are used, sneak up on the ships. Well, Satan's same way. Him and his demon horde. Uh, so he's going to use any means he can to try to wreck our ship. It's an individual one-on-one -on -one with Jehovah. And, you know, many of you, I look out, see you couples that are very close, love each other. Well, you know your mate, for those of you who are married, has to have this kind of relationship with their father, Jehovah. Everybody does. You know, unless you're a toddler, then you're going to be in God's hands uh, if you're parents or witnesses, it's a good chance you'll be okay. So this is war. That's the point. This is war. And it's not going to get easier. We're watching governing body member Tony Morris giving a war cry at the 2022 annual meeting of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. Yes, this is war. Never mind the compassion that Jeffrey Jackson spoke about in his previous talk on the program. No, apparently, the gloves are off. Jehovah's Witnesses should look forward to the sea being no more. The sea being everyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness. Wicked mankind. Because as we all know, if you don't acknowledge the authority of Tony Morris and his colleagues, if you don't accept that they are conspicuously wise and humble and have been handpicked by the creator of the universe as a channel with mankind, if you don't accept any of that, you must be wicked. Actually, if I'm being honest, that isn't particularly wicked. 
it would be weird, in my opinion, to look at this oaf, <laughs> this bumbling buffoon, and say, ah, yes, he's clearly been handpicked by the creator to convey his wisdom to mankind. You'd have to have something a little bit off, or let me put it another way, you'd have to be indoctrinated, preferably from youth, from when you were very, very small, to come to that conclusion. You're certainly not going to come to that conclusion if your first encounter with Tony Morris or Jehovah's Witnesses is to watch this video. You'd surely find that proposition ridiculous, which it is. But if we're talking about wickedness and the need to get rid of it, I think we've seen an excellent example of true wickedness in what Tony Morris says here. You know, your mate, for those of you married, has to have this kind of relationship with their father, Jehovah. Everybody does. You know, unless you're a toddler, then you're going to be in God's hands. Uh, if your parents are witnesses, that's a good chance you'll be okay. If you're a toddler, you're going to be in Jehovah's hands. If your parents are witnesses, there's a good chance you're going to be okay. Jehovah apparently wants to kill babies and is about to kill babies and is even potentially going to be killing some Jehovah's Witness babies because he leaves even that ambiguous. There's a good chance that a toddler is going to be okay if their parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. All bets are off if the parents aren't Jehovah's Witnesses then the toddler deserves to die, or may well deserve to die. If you think about it, it would make very little sense, let's say hypothetically that Armageddon were to happen, it would make very little sense for Jehovah to slaughter all adult non-Jehovah's Witnesses and leave behind their children, their babies, and expect their children to spend the rest of eternity praising the monster who has slaughtered their parents. I will mention this here in the chapter before 8, which would be chapter 7. Uh, we do find a point in verse 13. On that very day, Noah went into the ark along with his sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and notice, and his wife and the three wives of his sons. So they went in the ark. They had all worked around it and everything. And now we find in chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, uh, after the flood, go out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. So, here we go. See? But we know that's uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's what the scripture said. Uh, we don't know the names of the wife or the sons' wives. Why? You can ask God, but I don't see anything in here going to tell me why he decided not to have it in there. That has nothing to do with being worthy. It's all about the lineage that went through. And, you know, we all know better than, you know, argue with God. You know, God, uh, I really love your word, but, you know, a couple of things here. Uh, not too bright <laughs> <laughs> to have that kind of attitude. So... These are beautiful, faithful women. And here's the point. During the new world, my, what a family reunion they're going to have. And how thrilled you're going to be because I'm sure you got some questions about what that was like, you know. And then we don't have much while they were on the ark. 
how did things go? I mean, you know, a lot of the old timers here at Bethel and other Bethels have so many stories and they're a pleasure. Well, get ready. Whole lot of sensational stories from sensational family reunions like this one. See? Yeah, get ready for those sensational stories <laughs> from the Ark women, the nameless Ark women who are going to be resurrected in a sensational resurrection. It's not just an ordinary, mundane resurrection. It's a sensational resurrection. <laughs> and when they're resurrected, they're going to have some stories to tell. They're going to be able to answer all of your questions about what it was like to spend, what was it, months bobbing around in a box with eight and a half million land-dwelling species. So pairs of the eight and a half million. So we're talking 17 million plus animals. Uh, lots of dung. <laughs> Lo lots of unpleasant smells. Um, yeah, there's going to be some really interesting stories there. Can't wait to hear them. Um, sensational is certainly one word, probably an appropriate word, because it's, it is sensationalism, isn't it? It's indulging in fantasies. All of Toni Morris's talk is essentially this babbling about the resurrection and about how amazing it's going to be in the paradise when Bible characters are resurrected. Apparently, anyone will just be able to ask any Bible character of their choice anything. Bible characters in the New World will become like after-dinner speakers. <laughs> we saw this in the convention dramatizations, where in one dramatization, it's a dinner table, and Joseph, minus his technical a dream coat, <laughs> is like an after-dinner speaker. Um, they'll do the rounds, apparently. Earth's population will have swollen from 8 billion to 50, 60, 70 billion or more. <laughs> and yet the few dozen or few hundred Bible characters will be available to everybody. You know, you'll, you'll just have to speak to their diary manager, I guess, <laughs> so that you can squeeze them into your function um, and quiz them on their experiences. But yes, Toni Morris here zeroing in on the story of Noah's Ark, which we know is a favorite story of his. He did his convention talk. I forget which year it was. It was quite recent. Story time with Uncle Tony is, I think, what I called the sushi, a thumbnail of which will appear if Tibor is gracious. Tony takes the Noah's Ark story literally, as in fairness do all Jehovah's Witnesses. And at this particular point in his talk, he's decided to grapple with the issue of why the women on the Ark aren't named. It has nothing to do with being worthy. It's all about the lineage that went through. And, you know, we all know better than you know, argue with God. You know, God, uh, I really love your word, but you know, a couple of things here. Uh, not too bright <laughs> to have that kind of attitude. So, in other words, he doesn't have a clue and he's just making it up as he goes along. Isn't it just obvious in his body language that this clown is just spewing gibberish and hoping people fall for it? For me, it's a fairly obvious explanation if we're asking why weren't the Ark women or the women on Noah's Ark named in the book of Genesis? Well, first of all, because none of it actually happened. Or if it did happen, the flood of Noah's day, which is physically an impossibility to squeeze eight and a half million species into a box... Don't get me started on all of the other reasons why Noah's flood 
couldn't have happened, but there are many. But even if it did happen, it's clear that the Bible writers weren't really that interested in honouring women. Let's be honest. In Bible times, women were considered chattel. They were basically on a par with the livestock. They were property in Bible times. And when you read the books of the Pentateuch, when you read the Old Testament, that is painfully obvious. The Bible writers had almost no respect for women. And this extended, by the way, all the way into the New Testament, where you had the Apostle Paul saying, I desire the women to be silent in the congregation. God has always had a problem, it seems, with females, with anyone that isn't in possession of a penis. You are, unfortunately, a second-class citizen. That's the way, it's not just a Jehovah's Witness thing, that's the way the Bible views things. But I found it more than a bit hypocritical of Toni Morris to do that joke about, oh, you're going to argue with God. Oh God, I really like your word, but it could just do with fixing in one or two places. Isn't that exactly what the organization does with the Bible? We've seen in this very annual meeting a Caleb and Sophia cartoon where they add a story to the Bible and then treat it as though it is a biblical story. And in my doctored series, thumbnail here to the first episode if Tibor is gracious, <laughs> I've already plugged it in this rebuttal, I'm conscious of that. But this point bears repeating. Tony Morris is part of a group of men who promote a version of the Bible that has been doctored from the original. And I think I'm on 24 examples so far and counting. There are more episodes of that series to be made. This is an organization that only views it as God's word to a point. They believe that if the Bible says something that contradicts their teachings or that sounds awkward or embarrassing in some way, they are entitled to change God's word. You take chapter 22 of Genesis, Jehovah gives this direction. And any of you that are fathers or you're listening, and I, you don't have to be a father to be touched by this, obviously, as uh, you love Jehovah and you love Jesus. But he says in verse 2, Take please your son, your only son, whom you so love. Oh, yeah, he knew. Oh, Abraham sure loves Isaac. And this is remarkable. He knows he loves him so much, and what's he tell him to do? Sacrifice him. So we, we don't have all the, or any record of any feelings that Abraham had during all this. We get some indication of some things going on here, but uh, those of you that have ever had a son or sons, the impact here is just phenomenal. He did go all the way with the knife, and he had actually, in mind and heart, committed the sacrifice. But Jehovah, you know, after he reached out with the knife and everything's in motion, Jehovah had the angel call out, Abraham, Abraham, just in time. That stopped the whole thing. And Abraham said, here I am. And then he told him in verse 12, do not harm the boy. Oh, how did he feel? Talk about a relief. And all this time, before, Isaac's wondering, you know, we got this all set up. Where's the sheep? <laughs> I don't know, they must have had some interesting conversations after these events. Now, you think that uh, they're not going to enjoy a sensational family reunion? Oh, my. 
And then when they find out, because they didn't know, they heard certain things, Jehovah, he went all the way and allowed the sacrifice with his son. Ah, oh, see that pain, a lot of pain. We've been watching Governing Body member Tony Morris giving evidence of his profound wisdom and knowledge at the 2022 annual meeting in his talk titled, They Will Be Sensational. It will be sensational when Isaac and Abraham are resurrected in the paradise. And it's going to make for an awkward conversation for the reasons Tony has explained. What can I say? Tony Morris is speaking here from the very unique position of being both a governing body member and a father. He is, to my knowledge, the only governing body member with any sort of parental experience. And quite frankly, that shows <laughs> when we think about some of the anti-child rhetoric that's come out of the governing body in recent years on JW broadcasts and that sort of thing. But Tony Morris looks upon the account in Genesis 22 seemingly with unending admiration for Abraham. He thinks it was brilliant that Abraham was willing to slaughter his son Isaac, whom he loved. He thinks that's an example of superior morals. That's Tony Morris for you. I just want to contrast the words you've just heard from Tony Morris with a different source. And before I play this clip, this clip is not a Jehovah's Witness clip. It's actually one of my favorite all-time speakers and authors who has since died. And this clip will contain some swearing. It will, in fact, contain the F word. I try to keep swearing of any kind out of these rebuttals for obvious reasons. But when it comes to the F word in particular, I think there are a few better examples of where that particular word is warranted than in the following clip. The second uh, thing I live for is, um, if not exactly passing on my genes, taking part in activities that might allow those genes to be passed on. <laughs> and not... <clears throat> and uh, not scorning the, the three delightful children who result, who are everything to me and who are my only chance of a, even a glimpse of a, a second life, let alone an immortal one. And I'll tell you something, if I was told to sacrifice them to prove my devotion to God, if I was told to do what all monotheists are told to do and admire the man who said, yes, I'll gut my kid to show my love of God, I'd say, no, fuck you. <laughs> Thank and you, so should you, and the religions that say you should admire infanticide as but proof of the love of God have no claim, no claim at all to be preaching ethics, let alone morality. I hope you can understand why I've played this clip. I don't have too much to add to it. How do you refute that? Anyone, especially who's been a parent, who's felt just the overwhelming feelings of maternal or paternal love for their child will relate to those words. And I don't think you even need to be a parent to understand where Hitch, the late Christopher Hitchens, is coming from here. How can you possibly admire the man who would do that? who would say, yeah, I think I'm going to kill my kid because of voices in my head. You don't think about it that way as a Jehovah's Witness. And I'm sure the same can be said for all of the monotheisms, for all of the various denominations of Christianity. And yet it's embedded in our traditions, isn't it? We're supposed to think Abraham was acting in a rational, admirable manner 
when in fact the actions described in Genesis 22 were plainly barbaric. Now another one in scripture, let's find Job and how well we know and appreciate Job so much. And I'm going to go right there to the first chapter. And it just uh, helps us to appreciate in the first chapter here, verse 1 talks about this upright man of integrity. And verse 2 reveals it. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. And then all the livestock mentioned. But this is quite interesting in verse 4. Of chapter 1, each of his sons would hold a banquet at his house on his own set day. Well, what's that all about? Well, we have the gift of the insight book, as well as so many other references, but it's always been a blessed gift. And the insight stated, it would seem that Job's seven sons held a family gathering, possibly a spring or harvest festival, and as the feasting made the week-long circuit, each son hosted the banquet in his own house. That's a close family. They were all there, just such a close family that loved each other. Just loved each other. See? They just loved each other. There was so much love because they gathered together. For these spring harvest festivals, are these fertility festivals then? <laughs> if they were spring or harvest festivals, Tony, why not just say in the verse they would gather together for spring harvest festivals? Then it's just obvious, isn't it? Then there's no ambiguity. We don't need to guess about these things. We don't need to use shady language like it would seem, or possibly, meaning we don't have a clue. That's what the writers of the Insight book are really telling us when they use those sorts of words. They don't have a clue. They're just frantically trying to square the circle when there's a far more obvious explanation here, which is that when it's talking about Job's sons celebrating on their own set day, what it's talking about are birthdays. These were very likely birthday celebrations. In fact, if you look in the New International Version, I'm not going to include this as an example of the New World Translation being doctored, by the way, because as far as I can tell, the New International Version is the only Bible that renders this passage in this way but it says his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them sort of makes sense doesn't it if it's to do with the spring or harvest isn't that pagan isn't that some kind of fertility celebration but if it's a day that's been set aside for celebrating a person if it's their set day of course it's going to be realistically their birthday so i'm just going to leave that there really for any jehovah's witnesses who insist and there are many who insist that whenever the bible describes birthdays it does so in a negative light. Welcome to the School for Overseers, Principles of Divine Oversight, Acts 6-3. I invite you to read with me the verse that is the basis for this school, Acts 6, verse 3. So brothers, select for yourselves seven reputable men from among you, full of spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint them over this necessary matter. Due to the rapid expansion of the work taking place around the world, there's a pressing need for more loving 
and effective overseers. What would you say are the marks of a good overseer? An overseer's primary job is to take care of people. He humbly accepts the reality that he does not know everything or have all the answers. Don't get stuck in the past. Be the point of contact for your fellow workers. A good overseer is all of those, but he must also follow the divine pattern of oversight. Training is essential, but how it's done is crucial. To this end, Principles of Divine Oversight, Acts 6-3, a school for overseers, will help brothers in oversight prepare others to become loving and effective overseers in the future. The school is rooted in Bible principles. Let's read together the last scripture in Ezekiel chapter 48. Verse 35 says, And the name of the city from that day on will be Jehovah is there. Brothers, when you apply the divine pattern of oversight by proactively training others and humbly keeping your gates open to fresh lines of thought, you can be absolutely sure that Jehovah will reward your sincere efforts. Yes, divine blessings will not only flow into your department, but they will cascade throughout your entire branch, bringing refreshment. Uh, we tried it out already on a few Bethelites, and uh, they appreciated it very much. We'll have to take your word for that, David Splain. I hope no pillows were damaged. So yes, this is a promo video for a new school that's got a short, punchy name, which I've somehow already forgotten. <laughs> Welcome to the School for Overseers, Principles of Divine Oversight, Acts 6-3. Yeah, that school. That's the one I'm referring to. It's a new school for overseers. And who knew? Apparently, it turns out that if you're reaching out for more authority in the Jehovah's Witness religion, if you're looking to be an overseer who's valued what you need is to be loving and to care about the brothers and sisters. So you need to caringly and lovingly be willing to cover up child abuse if necessary. That's the sort of love and care we're talking about here. Look, I spent a year as an elder for Jehovah's Witnesses. I really wish it were true that elders are loving and caring and genuinely seek to put the needs of people in their congregation first and care for their well-being. But I've seen firsthand too many examples of the opposite being true to fall for any of the fluffy rhetoric that we've just seen. And those who've been watching this channel for a while now will be able to think of countless experiences, people I've interviewed over the years, whose treatment by elders has been disgraceful. Elders who have been following what's expected of them by the organization, following the advice that's laid out for them in the Shepherd book, who have treated the flock with contempt who've treated their brothers and sisters like numbers being processed. The organization, the well-being of the organization, the demands of the organization will always come first. So you'll forgive me if I struggle to get on board with the way elders are characterized in this latest promo. Anyway, that's all I have for you in this video. This is obviously part one of two. Look out for part two of my review of the 2022 annual meeting in, I guess, the coming weeks. Don't forget in the meantime, if you haven't done so already, to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.